Now, some of you may be surprised that I have chosen a Presbyterian discussing radical changes in Christianity every 500 years as an opening to my sermon this morning. And I have to confess, maybe a little bit of it has to do with the title. Our Unitarian and universe, Universalist spiritual progenitors, our early spiritual ancestors, after all, were the losers in the battle for early Christianity in one of the first of the 500 year rummage sales. The Universalists believed that a loving and all powerful God would not be a God that would only save a portion of humankind for heaven and condemn everyone else to internal punishment. And what are called Unitarian beliefs now originated in a profound resistance to the idea of the Holy Trinity. It was called anti-Trinitarianism, anti-Trinitarians. You see, the whole idea of Jesus as the Son of God, Savior, and Christ are beliefs that grew and changed over time the idea of Unitarianism, although it wasn't called that then, as opposed to Trinitarianism, has been around since the beginning of that change. In the 300s, the 300s, there was an Alexandrian priest named Arius, who was a proponent of the idea that there is only one God, that Jesus was created by God rather than being of God. Now, in the 300s, there were great divisions between groups of Christians like the Arians and Christians who believed that Jesus was of God, of God's divine nature. And that nature, they said, was Trinitarian, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So was, there was a great council, uh, the Council of Nicaea, in the year 325. And at that council, this dispute was resolved and the Trinitarians won and the Arians and the others lost. The Nicene Creed that some of you uh, learned early on speaks to that win. But Arianism and anti-Trinitarians did not disappear Later on, in the 1500s, 1,200 years after all of this happened, while the Protestant Reformation was going on, anti-Trinitarian movements arose throughout Europe, including Italy, Poland, and Transylvania. And 500 years later, it is manifest in Unitarianism today. Many of our churches in our country and around the world still partner with Transylvanian churches, the Unitarian Christian churches. So all of this is prelude to what I wanted to talk about today. What great ideas and radical change, how do they affect us now, right now, this year? I think they have to do with trying to find our place when the world is changing around us, when the world is becoming incomprehensible around us each and every day. I recognize yearning when I see it. I recognize yearning for finding purpose and meaning when I see it. What, what did Fandrich say? She said, how could these things not alter how we understand who we are and why we exist? Even though I am not a Christian, I recognize this, the, the call, the desire in the face of tumult and crises around us to have some kind of solid identity and a foundation, some like I said, some purpose and some relevance in one's life. 
The church that I belonged to when I was growing up was a product of a tectonic shift in Unitarianism. See, for centuries, the Unitarians believed in the fundamental goodness of human beings and the great gifts that were science and reason to faith. They held on to this all through the Civil War, all through the oppression and the persecution that followed. But the 20th century crises, the flu pandemic, the world wars, and the Holocaust in Europe changed all that for many European, many Unitarians. How could there be a God? How could there be a God and let this happen? How could we believe that people were good and have this still happen? And then humanism arose about 1933 in the United States, but humanism was, a, was an ideology that focused on the potential of humanity and the potential of humanity rather than divinity. And that appealed to many Unitarians. In 1959, my childhood congregation, a liberal church that had been started in 1909, so it was 50 years old, that congregation moved to its new modern building on a hill in the midst of another decade of terrible upheaval. It was the aftermath of World War II and nuclear proliferation. It was the time of the red scare, the red menace. It was a time of the eruption of the civil rights era. And by the time that we joined in 1963, the congregation was thoroughly humanist. So I do understand and have lived what it means to examine and challenge one's faith in a time of crisis. In times of crises, we want to sustain and be sustained by our faith. In times of desperate need, we want to bring the best love we have to give to meet the demands of the world that we live in now. And yes, we also want to find shelter from the demands of the world and the companionship of like-minded souls is a balm to our feelings. It's 2021, four years after Fandrich's blog, and all of us are in the midst of even greater crises than we were then. We have witnessed acts of kindness and grace and acts of appalling ignorance and selfishness. At times I have felt, and I imagine that you too have felt completely unequal to the task of finding a way forward through this. There will be a reckoning, both in society and in our homes. It has already begun. In this pandemic, a church, our church, still goes on. We have our worship, our children's education, our interest groups, our committees, our spiritual gatherings, our pastoral care. We have gained more social activism, but we've lost some things. We've lost the frequency and variety of adult education that we valued. We've gotten more sophisticated at connecting, but we miss the contact. We've gained opportunities for deep self-reflection and lost opportunities for camaraderie. So I viewed the results of our listening circles with a little trepidation. 
we have been moving from the old life of our church and into a new life, will we be able to go back? Will we see the possibilities? Or will we only have sight for the losses? Or maybe it's a bit of both. But what you, what you see in our future sets the course for our future. It shapes our future. That's what those listening circles are all about. How you see us and what you yearn for. And once again, as in every year that we've been doing this, you are astoundingly perceptive, thoughtful, and supportive of this community that you create. You'll hear more about the results of the listening circles next month, but I wanted to share with you some of what moves my heart and then I want others to know about us as well. You want more. We are constant works in progress and you want to aim higher and deeper. You are yearning for a stronger sense of what it means to be a Unitarian Universalist. You are yearning for a purpose and a presence in the wider world, to meet the demands and heal the wounds that are revealed in our society and in ourselves. You want to share the light, share how Unitarians and Universalists can be a force in the world. You want to keep reaching out beyond our walls, even after this pandemic eases expanding our welcome out of a desire for diversity and compassion and justice. You want to be public about our positions and seek partnerships in the work ahead. Our guiding principles are worthy and they can be brought to bear upon the challenges that we face. You know, you know, it will likely be a lifetime of commitment, a lifetime not without pain and not without risk. But you know that we can seek to receive and to give courage and care to each other. And you seek to sustain this congregation so that it can inspire lifetimes until the next generations. We are more than a building, more than a comfort, more than a cause. We are a way of being in the world that saves lives. So I invite us while we wait this pandemic out to leave behind all the things that will keep us from doing that and make room for the new. Thank you. And may it be so.